Well, it seems to me that Australia is being called at last to a very deep repentance. And I'm finding, um, even in the media, that the language of repentance is, is almost becoming commonplace. Australians uh, thought for a while that, that they were done with the language of sin, um, but it seems that it was not done with us. In January, the Australian of the Year was announced to be a young woman who had been groomed and raped by a man who abused his power over her. A young woman who was then silenced by a legal system that abused its power over her. And she bought both and won a bit. I know I'm not the only one who, um, as Grace Tame was announced as the Australian of the Year, felt something shift in Australia's consciousness. Um, but none of us could have foreseen what would soon afterwards be revealed in our capital about various forms of abuse against women and what has continued to be revealed bit by bit throughout this year. And closer to home, what, um, well, certainly what was not in the slightest bit a surprise to me, uh, what has been uh, released recently um, in um, a report from the Anglican Church of Australia uh, that demonstrated that domestic abuse occurs more often in the church than outside it, um, and that it has been linked to hierarchical views of marriage based on a poor reading of a small number of passages in the Bible. So when I saw that one of those passages was an optional reading in the lectionary for this week, I knew that we would have to address it this week. And um, look, it really does seem like too serious an issue to be looking at in our first week back after lockdown. I would prefer to be looking at an issue of hope and of healing. But here we are. Like it or not, COVID or not, we have come to a time of repentance in Australia, in our political systems and in our church systems, a time, I believe, initiated by God. And that means we cannot ignore Ephesians 5. Lives are at stake. It is that serious. Um, you may know I've, I've been around in Australia a number of places and I've known a lot of people who read this passage uncritically as imposing hierarchical structures on marriage, even to the point of insisting that husbands should make all important decisions or even all decisions for the family. And then what I have seen uh, in a lot of those families, not all, but a lot of them, is they would make these public statements about what they believe about marriage, but then they would go home and actually live out egalitarian marriages because most Christian men actually respect their wives and don't really believe that men make better leaders. But what happens is that what they have said publicly gives violent men the impression that Christians endorse the abuse of women by their husbands. And you might say that violent men are going to abuse their wives anyway, so it doesn't matter what Christians say publicly. But the thing is, Christian women are hearing this message as well. And some of them are believing that God tells them that they have to put up with whatever their husbands do to them. Bad Bible teaching has consequences 
Now, this is something I've generally generally seen in other places, but what I what I see more often around here is people saying, well, in this day and age, we don't really care what the Bible says about this stuff. And that that attitude puzzles me. See, because I don't understand what the day or the age has to do with it. If something is wrong in 2021, then how could it have been right in the year 021 or the year 051 or ever? We need to do better than that. We need to do the hard work of understanding what this passage is actually saying, what it was actually saying back in 051. Now, in a 15-minute sermon, I'm not going to get very far into that. So I have a transcript of a longer sermon I gave eight years ago, um, and it's got footnotes and recommendations for further reading. Um, and there's a link to a sermon uh, on YouTube that I gave at that time uh, that's on the website. Uh, that, that's, that's a lot more full, it's got a lot more details in it. So you can, you can go to that. In this time of repentance, when friends ask you what a Christian view of marriage is because they have heard that we condone abuse, please make sure that you have an answer ready. At least make sure you've begun to think it through because this is not a small matter. Lives are at stake. So this section of the letter to Ephesians is in a format that's not really familiar to us, but it was familiar to readers of ethics at the time. It's called a household code, first used by the philosopher Aristotle, who, um, by the way, didn't think that women were fully human and taught that the male is by nature better fitted to command than the female. Household codes gave instructions to the person in charge of the household, that is the husband, about how best to rule over his wife, children and slaves. These codes may have told the husband to be just and fair, but they, what they absolutely never did, what Paul alone of all of the ethicists of his time of the ancient world did, was to turn from addressing the husband to address the wife, the children and the slaves, and to take them seriously as rational, moral agents. Only Paul did that. In fact, Paul speaks to the women first. Aristotle would have been shocked and scandalised. Paul has taken his genre and rubbed it in his face. Far from being a despiser of women, as Paul is so often accused of being, he is our greatest advocate in the ancient world, apart from Jesus. If we look at the whole letter to the Ephesians, we see that it is all about how relationships are transformed by the Lordship of Christ. Paul tells the Ephesians to submit to a different master, to imitate a different father, to live by a different code. Paul was calling for nothing less than revolution, for the overthrow of all the values held by their friends in Ephesus, for a re-evaluation of everything they had thought and done in light of the fact that there is one Lord to whom we all owe allegiance above the husband, father and master, above his patron, above the patron's governor, even above the emperor. There is one real master. And that master is Jesus who died to bring the church into being. 
The Christian claim that Jesus is Lord denied the absolute authority of the emperor and called into question the entire hierarchical structure of the empire. Paul understood how treasonous this Christian confession would sound to the paranoid emperor and all emperors were by, by definition paranoid. He knew it could get his fledging con congregations into serious trouble. In the third century, Roman emperors caught on to this and vicious oppression was unleashed against the church. In the third century, the church was large enough and strong enough to survive that. In the first century, it was probably not. Paul needed to prepare these people to face martyrdom if necessary, but to refrain from doing anything that might unnecessarily bring martyrdom upon themselves. Now, you're thinking at this stage, you're overreacting, Margaret. Surely there's nothing treasonous about challenging the structure of the household. Well, try publicly challenging Australian family values and see what happens. Romans loved their family values at least as much as any culture ever has. Many of them could remember the raft of family values legislation pushed through the Senate by Augustus. Laws with serious consequences for anyone who chose not to marry and raise children. Families mattered in Rome because families produced the soldiers who would defend their empire in the future. Families were also uh, a microcosm of the empire. The power of the father echoed the power of the emperor. And any challenge to the father's power was a challenge to the emperor himself. If Paul was going to call for his fledging, fledgling churches to rethink family life in light of the gospel, he was going to need to do it very, very carefully. Any of you close enough to my age would know from Tracy Chapman that talk about a revolution sounds like a whisper. What Paul came up with was a brilliant political strategy based on the life and teaching of Jesus. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to people, but not because you're afraid of them, not because you have been ordered to, not because they are fitted by nature to rule you, not because you want something from them, but because you reverence Christ. Because you honour Christ when you respect the people Christ created. Because even though the human in front of you might be a worthless scumbag, Jesus, who created that worthless scumbag, is always worthy of reverence. Submit to everyone, and that way those who think they deserve your reverence will be satisfied. And those who think they deserve nothing will be reminded of the dignity that they have as human beings created in the image of God. I'm reminded of a scene from Johannesburg, of a black child walking along the street with his mother a white bishop passes them and doffs his hat at the child's mother. This simple act of respect changed the universe for this small boy and set him on a path to becoming the man who we now know as Bishop Desmond Tutu. Paul's political strategy sows the seed of revolution in the world and in the home. It means you can be humble without being humiliated. It means you can treat another person as though they are more important than you without buying into the hierarchy that keeps you 
apart. The psychiatrist Viktor Frankl, who survived a Nazi concentration camp, wrote that everything can be taken away from a person except one thing, the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in a given set of circumstances, to choose one's way. To women, slaves and children who at that time had no power, Paul writes of the dignity they had to choose their attitude to their subjection. And he gives them the honour in their servitude by showing them that while they served the man who happened to be their husband, master or father, they can be serving Christ. Their humility need not be meaningless. It matters for the kingdom of God. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives had no choice about being subject to their husbands. Legally, they were their husband's property. Physically, they were smaller, and many of them had the added vulnerability of being often pregnant at a time when the only reliable form of contraception was infanticide. They had no choice about whether they submitted to their husbands, but they could choose how they would submit. And so Paul advises them, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, like the church, like, like Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the saviour, like the church is subject to Christ. So also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. On first glance, that can sound a bit blasphemous. I mean, is Paul really telling wives to worship their husbands as though they are the creator and sustainer of the universe? I, I doubt Paul even imagined readers might take that interpretation, though if you read some people's interpretation of that, it, it almost sounds as though they do think that. Paul of course isn't saying that. He is pointing to an example of submission in which the one who submits is not diminished or degraded by the act of submission. In submitting to Christ, the church finds life and growth. So he says to wives, okay, okay, you're being forced to submit. You have no choice. So while you're doing it, model your submission on the church. However, the fact that Paul could tell wives, slaves and children to, the fact that he could call them to courageous Christian living within their servitude, that doesn't imply that servitude should be imposed. I mentioned Viktor Frankl earlier. His book includes advice he gave to friends about how to stay alive in a Nazi concentration camp. Now, nobody would read that and suggest that the conditions of a concentration camp should be imposed on people in order that they might have the opportunity to follow that advice. All life situations are transformed by the gospel, but that does not mean that all life situations are good or that we should hold back when we have the opportunity to relieve suffering or enhance human dignity. Paul did not explicitly call for the overthrow of slavery or patriarchy. But if more Christian men had paid attention to his words, husbands, fath his words to husbands, fathers and masters, those evils would have been eradicated sooner. The call to overthrow slavery and patriarchy isn't explicit in his words that's true since this is a public document written to be copied and distributed but it explicit words like that would have got the, not just Paul but the church into deep deep trouble but that call is subversively implied Jesus said that the preaching of the kingdom is not about whole trees planted, fully grown, but it's about seeds put in the ground to grow and bear fruit later. 
Husbands, he says, you legally have complete power over your wife under Roman law. Okay then, exercise your power the way Jesus exercised his, in love. And just in case you have some sentimental or patronising idea about love, I'm telling you that your love is to be modelled on Christ's love for the church. That means self-sacrifice. It means giving everything of yourself in order to see your wife become complete, whole, mature as the person she was created to be. It means that the fulfilment of your humanity is to be found in the full expression of her humanity. She is not there to serve you, quite the opposite. Just as Jesus came not to be served but to serve, so you are to serve your wife. Roman law doesn't command that of you, but the law of Christ does. Just as the wife's servitude is transformed by the gospel, so the husband's mastery is transformed. It is transformed into servitude. We are blessed to live in a very different world. Women now have some legal protection against abuse and that means we can give women more options than those outlined in this passage. Options to leave abusive marriages and find safety for themselves and their children. Op options to obtain divorce. The humanity of men and women has been enhanced as we have begun to leave patriarchy behind. Women, men have been released to be persons, not masters. And women have been released to be active agents for good in the world. And the world is a better place for it. We can be grateful that the words of Paul eventually began to bear fruit. But power has a way of creeping back into relationships and harming people whenever and wherever it can. Power tends to be the enemy of love. It doesn't have to be. We can use our power for the good of others, but usually power hurts people. And that's why in the first century and in the 21st century, Whatever our legal system tells us, whatever it does for us, whatever it does against us, we are called in every relationship to humble ourselves and to be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Amen.